before we get into the main content, I just wanted to explain why I have chosen to make this video. One reason is because of the recently released Jeffrey Dahmer series on Netflix, which is brilliant if you haven't seen it yet. But the main reason I am making this is because I have always been extremely fascinated and horrified with the life and crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer. Cannibalism is so unfathomable, such a grotesque nightmare, I simply cannot comprehend it. You can put on the History Channel and hear of the Indonesian tribes of New Guinea, deep in the heart of some vast undergrowth, consuming the heart of an enemy. Or you can watch documentaries on the Mayan civilization, who would harvest human organs and consume them in sacrificial rituals. Cannibalism is something that does not happen in the 21st century. It does not happen in suburban America. I remember reading reports on the case. They just didn't seem possible. Cannibalism, necrophilia, dismemberment, drilling holes through skulls, preserving bones, freezing organs, dissolving human beings in acid. It just seemed too far-fetched. But Jeffrey Dahmer was able to fool everyone into thinking that he was a regular man. He fooled judges, his family, friends, and unfortunately, 17 young men and boys over a 17-year period. As Jeffrey Dahmer himself said, he, quote, created a holocaust. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born in West Allis, Wisconsin, on May 21st, 1960, to parents Lionel and Joyce Dharma. The pregnancy was a traumatic and painful experience for Joyce, who suffered with severe full-body convulsions that would last for hours, leaving her incapacitated and reeling with pain. In his 1994 book, A Father's Story, Lionel Dharma wrote, quote, At times, her legs would lock tightly in place, and her whole body would grow rigid and begin to tremble. Her jaw would jerk to the right and take on a similarly frightened rigidity. During these strange seizures, her eyes would bulge like a frightened animal and she would begin to salivate, literally frothing at the mouth. Lionel also wrote how Joyce vomited throughout the pregnancy, almost as if she was revolted by having Geoffrey growing inside her. Her condition also caused Joyce to continuously believe she would miscarry. At the time Jeffrey was born, Lionel was attending the Marquette University in Milwaukee, working towards a degree in chemistry. His studying kept him away from the family home for long periods, meaning he was unable to devote as much time to Jeffrey as he would have wished. Time aside, Lionel flourished in fatherhood, and doted on his son. Joyce, however, grew to be extremely tense and angry around her son. She had also become greedy for attention, believing she deserved more from people, especially her husband, who spent any free time he had with their son. Whenever Lionel was home, Joyce demanded constant attention and praise from him, and would fret over the most trivial of matters, working herself into a high state of anxiety until she got what she wanted. Reality was, Joyce deeply resented her husband for leaving her to raise Geoffrey for the majority. Lionel, growing concerned for his wife's stability and the strain it caused on their marriage, moved his family to go live with his mother, giving Joyce the additional help that she obviously needed. Despite uprooting the family, the Dharma's marriage was slowly but steadily deteriorating and as a result, they argued constantly. Geoffrey, often listening at the top of the stairs, would take each argument to heart, especially when hearing his mother curse him and her husband for spending far too much time together. Geoffrey believed he was the cause of the desolation of his family, a belief that stayed with him his entire life. Shortly before his fourth birthday, Jeffrey was diagnosed with a double scrotial hernia, which required emergency surgery. This was, many speculate, the catalyst for his future deviance. As no one, his parents nor medical professionals, 
had explained exactly what was happening to him, Jeffrey felt extremely exposed and frightened by the many strangers that were exploring his adolescent body, touching and probing his genitalia. During an interview with Larry King in 2004, Lionel Dharma recalled Jeffrey's reaction to the surgery, saying, quote, He was very subdued to say the least, and he walked around like a little old man. I can still see him in his robe. He complained about hurting very much. He wondered if he had had his penis cut off. Following the surgery, Jeffrey had become noticeably introverted and distant, locking himself away from his parents. Lionel and Joyce, resolute in normalising Jeffrey's life, continued to push him into socialising with other children. Their efforts were in vain, and the little amount of affection he had previously shown his parents quickly disappeared. In October 1966, the Dharma family relocated to Doylestown, Ohio, with the hope that a new environment would rejuvenate Jeffrey. Joyce, heavily pregnant with their second child, hoped that a fresh start would mend the fractures within the family. On December 18th, the Dharma family welcomed a healthy baby boy to the world, and both parents anticipated an improvement in Jeffrey's escalating mood and enthusiasm at the prospect of having a baby brother. In a strategic move, hoping it would make Jeffrey feel more involved, Joyce and Lionel allowed him to name his baby brother, who he named David. Having a brother did little to improve Jeffrey's behaviour and attitude. He remained neutral towards David, and although they rarely fought or argued, they never became close either. Soon after the birth of David, Lionel obtained his degree in chemistry and subsequently found employment as an analytical chemist. In 1968, the family relocated again, moving to Bath, Ohio. During one family dinner, Jeffrey sat at the table noticeably mesmerised, looking at the defleshed carcass of the roast chicken that they had just eaten. Jeffrey asked his father what would happen if you placed the bones of the chicken in bleach. Lionel, who had grown greatly concerned as to Jeffrey's low mood, was delighted that his son was displaying genuine scientific curiosity and interest. Lionel willingly demonstrated exactly how to safely bleach and later preserve the bones. From that moment, after watching his father dissect and bleach the chicken bones, Jeffrey became fascinated with animals and their bodies, curious how they looked in the inside. Initially, he collected insects, spiders and dragonflies, keeping them in glass jars so he could watch them move freely. However, Jeffrey's inquisitiveness progressed and he soon began to collect larger animals mostly those he found dead on roadsides. Once he brought them home, he would skin the animals, taking great care to caress the exposed muscles beneath. After dissection, he would dismember the animals and dispose of the remains. From his earliest year at Revere High School, Jeffrey was perceived as an outcast and someone in which to keep a great distance. Classmates would later detail their shock and concern at the fact Jeffrey would routinely drink hard liquor and beer in school, which he would smuggle in the lining of his jacket. On one occasion, a classmate observed Jeffrey consume a large cup of gin at 9am and had asked him what he was drinking, to which he casually replied, quote, Oh, it's just my medicine. Despite his alcohol abuse, Jeffrey was known to teachers as being a very polite student with high intelligence. He initially achieved only average grades, but his teachers attributed this to his escalating apathy, not unintelligence. It was during his high school years that Jeffrey discovered that he was homosexual. He did not confide his sexual orientation to his parents for fear of creating further tension between them. By his own later admission, his earliest sexual fantasies had embraced the concept of the dominance and control of a completely subservient partner. 
When aged just 16, Jeffrey conceived and hoped to execute a fantasy of rendering a jogger unconscious so he could then have sexual intercourse with the lifeless body. One day, with a baseball bat in his hand, Jeffrey concealed himself behind a row of trees adjacent to the path he knew the jogger would take. The plan was to wait until the man run past, then he would strike. If the attack left the man dead, so be it. Fortunately, on this particular day, the jogger did not pass Jeffrey. Although the attack never come to fruition, it would mark the first time Jeffrey had attempted to attack another individual. It was also the first time that sex and violence connected in the real world, no longer confined to fantasy. Despite being regarded as a social pariah by his peers in high school, Jeffrey had nevertheless become somewhat of a class clown. Due to the pranks he would stage to amuse his classmates, Jeffrey's bizarre acts, which included loudly bleating, simulating epileptic seizures and cerebral palsy, and knocking over goods at the local mall, become known as doing a dharma. These episodes, which received high praise from those in attendance, allowed Jeffrey to fit in enough to get through his schooling. However, by 1977, his grades had rapidly declined owing to his alcohol abuse and his continued apoplectic attitude towards academic and social interactions. In 1978, during Jeffrey's senior year, Lionel and Joyce Dharma ended their marriage. Couple counselling did not stop the rot in the relationship and it became evident that nothing could fix the marriage, much to Jeffrey's despair. Jeffrey found the divorce hard and because he was now 17 years of age, the court did not decide which parents he would live with. Lionel and Joyce were fighting bitterly in court over the custody of David, which enraged Jeffrey considerably. He believed he was unwanted and unloved, a burden that neither parent were interested in. Again, in his eyes, his brother was getting all the love and attention that he felt he himself deserved. Joyce eventually won full custody of David and she promptly moved state and moved in with her family. Jeffrey would rarely see his mother and brother from that moment on. Lionel moved out of the family home and left Jeffrey in the care of his grandmother. On June 18th, 1978, three weeks after graduating high school, aged just 18 years of age, Jeffrey claimed his first victim. 18-year-old Stephen Mark Hicks was hitchhiking to Lockwood Corners to attend a rock concert when he was picked up by Jeffrey. With the offer of plenty of beer, Hicks agreed to go home with Jeffrey. Jeffrey knew the family home was empty following the divorce so the pair could enjoy their drinks without the fear of interruption. The pair enjoyed several hours of drinking and listening to music together. After a while, Hicks announced that he would have to leave or he would or he would not make it to the concert. By stating he wanted to leave, Jeffrey became full of anger and disappointment, fueled by the abandonment he had felt since his parents' divorce. Jeffrey knew he could not risk losing Hicks. Acting fast, Jeffrey retrieved a ten pound dumbbell and struck Hicks twice in the back of his head. Once unconscious, Jeffrey used the bar of the dumbbell to strangle Hicks to death. Once deceased, Hicks was stripped of clothes and Jeffrey stood over the nude corpse masturbating. Jeffrey then took the body under the crawl space of the house and using a hacksaw dismembered Hicks. Jeffrey buried the body parts in a shallow grave in the garden. Several weeks later, Jeffrey unearthed the remains and stripped the decaying flesh from the bones. The flesh was later dissolved in a fat of acid, which was then poured down a storm drain. Jeffrey pulverised the skeleton with a sledgehammer and scattered the fragments across a wooded ravine. Years later, when reflecting on Stephen Hicks, Jeffrey commented that the day he picked the young man up was the day that, quote, 
the nightmare become a reality. Once Jeffrey had actually committed his first murder, when he finally acted upon his fantasies, the compulsion to kill took control of his entire life. Six weeks after the murder of Stephen Hicks, Lionel Dahmer and his new fiance returned to the Dharma home to find Jeffrey living there alone. That August, wanting to please his father and not wanting to be such a burden, Jeffrey enrolled into Ohio State University, hoping to major in business studies. However, Jeffrey would only last a single semester after missing too many classes due to his continued alcohol abuse. Lionel had once paid Jeffrey a surprise visit only to find his dorm room in complete disarray, floor strewn with empty liquor bottles. In January 1979, following heartfelt discussion with his father, with Lionel telling his son that his chances were running out, Jeffrey enlisted into the US Army. He was quickly deployed to Baumholder in West Germany, where he was trained as a medic specialist. After a promising start to his career, Jeffrey's performance deteriorated owing to his alcoholism, and on March 1981, he was deemed unfit and unsuitable for military duty. He was discharged and sent home, although honourably, as his superiors believed that any issues Jeffrey had in the army would not be problematic in civilian life. Interestingly, during the period Jeffrey served at the US Air Force Base in Germany, the remains of five mutilated murder victims were recovered in areas in close vicinity to the base. Jeffrey was never formally questioned or criminally associated with the murders, but many speculate it is more than simple coincidence. Upon his return to Ohio, Jeffrey initially moved in with his father and now wife. He insisted he be given chores to perform around the house to occupy his time whilst he searched for employment. Good intentions aside, Jeffrey continued to drink heavily and whilst intoxicated, he would cause trouble in and around his father's home. Just two weeks after his return, Jeffrey was arrested for drunken disorderly conduct for which he received a suspended 10-day jail sentence and a fine of $60. Lionel tried unsuccessfully to get his son to stop drinking and, at his wit's end, sent Jeffrey back to his grandmother's, who he knew was the only person capable of getting through to his son. He hoped her influence would be enough to help him find employment, sober up and live responsibly. For a while, the living arrangement worked well. Jeffrey was accompanying his grandmother to church and helped her around the house. He did, however, continue to drink heavily. Under the guidance of his grandmother, Jeffrey found employment at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center as a phlebotomist, which pleased his father greatly. Jeffrey held this position for 10 months before he was laid off. He would remain unemployed for the next two years, leaving him to live off whatever money his grandmother could spare. In January 1985, while sitting alone reading in the West Allis Public Library, Jeffrey was handed a piece of paper by a man he did not know, asking him if he wanted oral sex. Although he did not respond to the proposition, he later commented that the proposal stirred his old fantasies of control and dominance that he had developed as a teenager. The exchange with the man awoken the deviance that had already caused him to murder. As his fantasies gradually intensified, Jeffrey regularly visited Milwaukee's gay bars, gay bookstores and gay bathhouses. Whilst there, he familiarised himself with the different locations, watching the inhabitants and studying how the men would approach each other and how they acted. This research would prove pivotal later when he used what he had learned at the clubs to convince many men to return home with him. At some point during his research, his need to be sexually intimate with a man grew too strong to resist, but he still lacked the confidence needed to approach somebody. Instead, Jeffrey stole a male mannequin from a clothing store. He used this as a sex aid 
holding it whilst he masturbated and would lay beside it and caress the muscle outlines on its chest. His grandmother would later discover it whilst cleaning Jeffrey's bedroom and gave Jeffrey an ultimatum, get rid of it or move out. Jeffrey got rid of it, knowing it was time he sought out living partners. By late 1988, Jeffrey was a known regular at many different gay bars and bathhouses and as such, many men became interested in him. By now, his confidence was high and he was having sexual intercourse with many of the men he met there. He was still extremely frustrated, however, as his sexual partners would not remain still and silent during sex, as he had instructed. For this reason, Jeffrey began to lace his partner's drinks with sleeping pills so he could enjoy intercourse with their unconscious bodies. Jeffrey soon got sloppy, however, and overconfident and he got caught administering sleeping pills to numerous men. As a result, the bathhouses and clubs revoked his memberships. This left Jeffrey little choice when meeting men, having to resort to cheap motel rooms. On November 20th, 1987, Jeffrey met 25-year-old Stephen Tuomi in a West Alice bar. The two flirted and danced together, all seeming harmless. Jeffrey made it clear to Stephen that he wished to be more than friends and suggested the pair rent a room in the nearby Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee. Once inside the hotel, Jeffrey spiked a drink with sleeping pills and gave it to Stephen. After his arrest, Jeffrey stated that he had no intention of killing him, he just wanted to lay next to his unconscious body. However, when Jeffrey woke the following morning, he found Stephen dead in bed, with blood dried around his mouth, and his body was covered in bruises. Jeffrey's fists and forearm were also heavily bruised. Jeffrey had obviously beaten the man to death, but had no memory of doing so. Panicked, Jeffrey left the hotel and fetched a large suitcase. Stephen's body was transported in the case back to Jeffrey's grandmother's house, where it was dismembered before dissolving the flesh in acid. Two months after Tuomi's murder, Jeffrey encountered 14-year-old James Dox Tatter outside a gay bar. With an offer of $50 to pose nude for the photograph, James returned home with Jeffrey. After the photographs were taken, James was rendered unconscious when he drank a sleeping pill laced beer. After fondling the boy, Jeffrey strangled him to death and took the corpse down to the crawl space where it was dismembered. Jeffrey was able to preserve James's skull in bleach, which he used many times as a masturbation aid. On March 24th, 1988, Jeffrey met a bisexual man named Richard Guerrero outside a local gay bar. Using the same offer as he did for James Doxtator, Jeffrey offered money in exchange for nude photographs. Once back at his grandmother's, Guerrero was given the sleeping pills laced beer and was strangled with a leather strap. Before dismembering the body, Jeffrey performed oral sex on the corpse. In September 1988, Jeffrey's grandmother asked him to move out. Amongst the reasons voiced was her strong disapproval of him bringing young men back to her home. She also complained of the foul odours emanating from both the basement and the garage. Jeffrey left the only home he had ever felt comfortable in and moved into a one-bedroom apartment in a cheap but rough neighbourhood. The day after moving into his new apartment... Whilst checking out his new surroundings, Jeffrey encountered a 13-year-old Laotian boy. The pair talked at length, and Jeffrey enticed the young boy to return home with him, promising $100 in exchange for nude photographs. Once inside the apartment, the boy was given a beer laced with sleeping pills. Whilst waiting for the pills to take effect, Jeffrey grew impatient and attempted to fondle the boy. Panicked, the 13-year-old ran out of the apartment, which Jeffrey had forgot to lock when they entered earlier. The boy ran to his home that was situated nearby. 
Upon hearing their son explain what had just happened, the boy's parents contacted the police, who would later arrest Jeffrey. On January 30th, 1989, Jeffrey was convicted of second-degree sexual assault, but released on bond until sentencing began in May. Immediately after the conviction, Jeffrey gave up tenancy of his apartment and moved back to his grandmother's home. During the interim, whilst waiting to hear if he would be given jail time, Jeffrey would kill again. On March 25th, 1989, Jeffrey met 24-year-old Anthony Sears at a gay bar. Jeffrey would later comment that on this particular occasion, he had no intention of murdering anyone, but shortly before the bar was about to close, Sears had approached Jeffrey and the pair agreed to leave together. Once at Jeffrey's grandmother's house, the pair engaged in oral sex. Sears shared several beers with Jeffrey, one of which was laced with sleeping pills. Jeffrey strangled Sears to death. The following morning, after spending the night naked next to the corpse, Jeffrey put the body in the bathtub where he dismembered it. Jeffrey would state later that he found Sears, quote, exceptionally attractive, and as such, it was the first victim for whom he permanently retained body parts. He preserved Sears' head and genitalia in acetone, and Jeffrey would keep these items until his arrest. On May 23, 1989, Jeffrey faced trial for the offence of sexual assault. During the trial, Jeffrey pleaded for leniency, stating, quote, This enticing of a child was the climax of my idiocy. If anything would shock me out of my past behaviour patterns, it is this. Judge Gardner, seemingly believing Jeffrey's sincerity and seeing something worth saving in him, gave Jeffrey a somewhat light sentence. Jeffrey received a year in a work release prison on orders that he received treatment and counselling for his alcohol and sexual problems. He was also required to register as a sex offender. In a terrible mix-up, Jeffrey, who was now fast approaching his release date, had not received a single session with professionals regarding his sexual and alcohol issues as requested by the judge. Lionel Dharma, terrified and furious that his son had no treatment whatsoever, wrote to Judge Gardner expressing his concerns with Jeffrey and pleaded he not be released until he had received the adequate psychological treatments. He wrote, quote, I sincerely hope that you might intervene in some way to help my son, who I love very much and for whom I want a better life. He later warned Judge Gardner that, quote, this may be our last chance to institute something lasting. Just one day after Lionel had mailed this letter, Jeffrey walked out of jail and back into the public, no better than he was before his sentence. On May 14th, 1990, Jeffrey again moved from his grandmother's home, moving into the Oxford Apartments on 924 North 25th Street in Milwaukee. Within a week of moving into his new apartment, Jeffrey murdered a sixth man. Jeffrey met Raymond Smith, a 32-year-old male prostitute, and he had accepted Jeffrey's offer to accompany him back to his apartment for $50 in exchange for sex. Jeffrey laced Smith's drink with seven sleeping pills, then strangled him to death. The following day, Jeffrey purchased a Polaroid camera, which he then used to photograph Smith's corpse in sexually suggestive positions. Jeffrey would also photograph the dismemberment of Smith. Jeffrey boiled Smith's Jeffrey boiled Smith's legs, arms and pelvis in Soilex, a strong abrasive chemical, in a steel kettle, which left Jeffrey able to simply rinse the flesh from the bones. The skull was preserved and spray-painted before being placed alongside the skull of Anthony Sears. In June 1990, 27-year-old Edward Smith was drugged and strangled at apartment 213. 
rather than acidifying the skeleton or repeating previous methods of bleaching, Jeffrey placed the corpse of Smith in his freezer for several months in the hope that it would strengthen the skeleton. This process proved unsuccessful and the body had to be dissolved in acid after thawing. Smith's skull was unintentionally destroyed when Jeffrey tried to dry it in the oven, which caused it to explode. Jeffrey would later tell the police that he felt terrible about this murder as he was unable to retain any parts of him. Less than three months after murdering Edward Smith, Jeffrey met 22-year-old Ernest Miller on the corner of 27th Street. Miller had returned to the Oxford Apartments on the strange offer of earning $80 to allow Jeffrey to lay next to him and listen to his heart and stomach. Once inside the apartment, Jeffrey attempted to perform oral sex on Miller, who declared, quote, that'll cost you extra. Jeffrey crushed the last two sleeping pills that he had left and mixed them in Miller's beer. When the pills failed to work fast enough, Jeffrey retrieved a kitchen knife and slashed Miller's throat, severing his carotid artery, killing him within minutes. Miller's corpse was photographed and placed in the bathtub to be dismembered. Jeffrey first removed the head, which he would repeatedly kiss and talk to as he cut up the rest of the body. Jeffrey removed the heart, biceps and portions of thigh muscle and placed them inside plastic bags, storing them in the fridge for later consumption. Miller's skull was painted with enamel and stored beside the others. Three weeks later, Jeffrey met 22-year-old David Thomas at the Grand Avenue Mall. Thomas was persuaded back to the apartment for drinks and also for the promise of earning money for nude photographs. Jeffrey would later comment that he felt no sexual attraction to Thomas, but he nevertheless murdered him. Jeffrey did not retain any parts whatsoever, but he did photograph the dismemberment process. Following the murder of David Thomas, Jeffrey would not kill again for almost five months, although on at least five different occasions between October 1990 and February 1991, he unsuccessfully attempted to lure men back to his apartment. In February 1991, Jeffrey met 17-year-old Curtis Strauter at a bus stop. After striking up conversation with the young man, Strauter agreed to return home to Jeffrey's apartment to have nude photographs taken for money. Strauter was drugged that night and strangled with a leather strap. After dismemberment, Jeffrey kept and preserved the skull, hands and genitals. Less than two months later, on April 7th, Jeffrey encountered 19-year-old Errol Lindsay, whom he persuaded to return home with him. Jeffrey drugged Lindsay's beer, and when he fell unconscious, Jeffrey performed sexual acts on him. Fueled by the growing lust to have a sexual partner that was completely at his disposal, Jeffrey experimented on Lindsay. A hole was drilled into Lindsay's skull, and acid was poured into his brain. Jeffrey hoped this would leave Lindsay alive, but completely submissive and unable to stop Jeffrey doing whatever he wished. Basically, he wanted a sexual zombie. Jeffrey later commented that Lindsay did regain consciousness and said, quote, I have a headache. What time is it? The experiment did not render Lindsay as submissive as planned, so he was drugged again and strangled to death. By 1991, Fellow residents at the Oxford Apartments had begun to complain about the terrible smells that seemed to emanate from apartment 213. They also complained about hearing the sound of a chainsaw late at night. Sopper Princewill, the apartment block manager, did contact Jeffrey in response to the complaints, to which Jeffrey claimed the smells were the result of a broken freezer and that several of his tropical fish had died. On the afternoon of May 26, 1991, Jeffrey approached 14-year-old Conorak Simpson Phone and persuaded him to come home with him to take some photographs for money. 
Unbelievably, and unknown to Jeffrey, Conorak was the brother of the young man that Jeffrey had gone to prison for fondling. Jeffrey drugged the 14-year-old and performed oral sex on his unconscious body. Like Errol Lindsay, Conorak had a hole drilled into his skull through which Jeffrey injected muriatic acid into the frontal lobe. After the procedure, Jeffrey managed to wake Conorak and walked him to the bedroom, where, on the bed, was the nude body of Tony Hughes, who Jeffrey had murdered just three days before. Once Conorak fell unconscious again, Jeffrey drank several beers and sat naked with the boy. When Jeffrey ran out of beer, he left his apartment to visit a nearby liquor store. In the early hours of May 27th, Jeffrey returned from the liquor store to find Conorak sitting naked on the street corner, being comforted by three concerned women. Jeffrey approached the group and explained that he and the boy were lovers and attempted to walk away with the boy. The three women dissuaded Jeffrey, warning him that they had contacted the police. Upon the arrival of police officers John Balzarak and Joseph Gabrish, Jeffrey's demeanour relaxed and he calmly spoke to the officers, explaining that the naked boy was in fact his 19-year-old lover and that he had just drunk too much. The three women, exacerbated, attempted to tell the officers that the boy had blood on his buttocks and how he had struggled when Jeffrey attempted to lead him away. The officers were harsh with the women, telling one to, quote, butt out, and another to, quote, shut the hell up. Radio transcripts taken that evening revealed the officers had joked about Conorak, laughing as they reported the, quote, intoxicated Asian that they had found. Against the protests of the young women, the officers covered the boy with a towel and began to walk him back to Jeffrey's apartment. Once there, looking to verify his earlier claim, Jeffrey showed the officers the semi-nude Polaroids he had taken earlier. The officers took a very brief look around the apartment, which consisted of looking around the living room, and then left the apartment, leaving the young boy in the hands of Jeffrey. The officers had later reported a strange and terrible smell in the apartment, but never reported it at the time. That smell was the decomposing corpse of Tony Hughes. If the officers had conducted a proper search of the apartment, many lives could have been spared. If they had only conducted a background check on Jeffrey, which is routine in domestic disputes, it would have revealed Jeffrey to be a convicted child molester currently on probation. As soon as the two officers left the apartment, Jeffrey injected a second syringe of acid into the boy's brain, which on this occasion proved fatal. The following day, Jeffrey took a day's leave from work so he could devote his whole day to the dismemberment of Conorak Simpson phone and Tony Hughes. He kept both skulls but discarded the rest of the corpses. On June 30th, 1991, Jeffrey travelled to Chicago where he later met 20-year-old Matt Turner at a bus station. Turner accepted the offer to travel back to Milwaukee, where Jeffrey promised to conduct a professional photo shoot. Turner was drugged, strangled and dismembered the day he went home with Jeffrey. Jeffrey removed the head, heart, liver and kidneys and stored them in the freezer. Five days later, 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger had returned to apartment 213 on the promise that Jeffrey would provide alcohol for the entire weekend. Once drugged, Jeffrey drilled a hole into Weinberger's skull and injected his brain with boiling water. Weinberger fell into a coma, from which he died two days later. On July 15th, 1991, Jeffrey met 29-year-old Oliver Lacey, who agreed to pose for nude photographs. Lacey was later rendered unconscious with chloroform and then strangled to death. Jeffrey later had sexual intercourse with the corpse before dismembering it. Jeffrey had removed the head, 
heart and most of the skeleton and stored them in the freezer. Four days later, on July 19th, Jeffrey received news that he was going to be fired from his job. Upon hearing the news, he had gone out and lured 25-year-old Joseph Braidhaft back to his apartment where he was strangled. Jeffrey left the corpse on his bed, covering it with a bedsheet. Four days later, Jeffrey removed the sheet, only to find Braidhaft's head crawling with maggots. Jeffrey removed the head, cleaned it, and placed it in the fridge. On July 22nd, 1991, Jeffrey approached three men at the local mall and offered $100 to any one of them to accompany him back to his apartment to pose for photographs. One of the men, 32-year-old father of six, Tracy Edwards, agreed to the proposal and left the mall with Jeffrey. Upon entering apartment 213, Edwards noticed a foul stench in the air and saw several boxes of muriatic acid scattered across the floor. Jeffrey claimed the acid was used to clean bricks and that the smell was due to a plumbing issue. After several beers, Jeffrey pointed to his tropical fish aquarium in the corner of the room, asking Edwards if he liked the colours. When Edwards turned to look, Jeffrey snapped a handcuff onto his wrist. Edwards, laughing at first, asked what was happening. Jeffrey suddenly pulled out a large knife and held it to Edward's chest, instructing him to walk into the bedroom. When they entered the bedroom, Edwards noticed the many posters on the walls depicting nude men in suggestive poses. He could also see a 57-gallon drum in the corner, which seemed to be the major cause of the terrible smell that clung in the air. Brandishing the knife, Jeffrey informed Edwards that he wanted to take nude photographs of him. In an attempt to delay Jeffrey, he unbuttoned his shirt and declared he would love to be photographed, but could he remove the handcuff and put the knife away? Jeffrey did not respond to the request. Instead, he put on a VHS copy of The Exorcist 3 on the TV. Edwards watched Jeffrey as he began to rock back and forth chanting and mumbling incoherently to himself. After several minutes, Jeffrey turned back to Edwards. He placed his head on Edwards' chest, listening to the rapid beat of his heart. With the knife still held against Edwards, Jeffrey declared that he was going to eat his heart. In an attempt to prevent an attack, Edwards continuously repeated to Jeffrey that he was a friend and that he could be trusted to not run away. Edwards asked to use the bathroom, which Jeffrey ignored. Edwards then asked if they could go sit in the living room and share a beer together. Jeffrey accepted and walked Edwards back to the couch. When his beer was nearly empty, Edwards again asked to use the bathroom. Jeffrey nodded and stood up. Edwards saw that Jeffrey had not only left the knife on his seat, he had also dropped the other end of the handcuffs. Before Jeffrey had time to realise his mistake, Edwards jumped to his feet and punched Jeffrey as hard as he could, knocking him to the floor. Edwards ran to the door, unlocked it and ran into the night. At around 11.30pm on July 22nd, Tracy Edwards flagged down a patrol car on the corner of North 25th Street. Pointing to the handcuff hanging from his wrist, Edward explained how a, quote, freak had put it there and planned to kill him. Edwards asked the officers if they could use their keys to remove the cuffs. When their keys did not work, the officers agreed to accompany him back to the apartment he had just escaped. Neither Edwards nor the police officers could have foreseen the horror that they would find inside the apartment. When the trio arrived at the apartment, Jeffrey invited them in, smiling confidently. He acknowledged that he had put the handcuffs on Edwards, but did not offer a reason why. At this point, Edwards told the officers that Jeffrey had had a large knife and spoke of Jeffrey's bizarre comments about eating his heart. Again, Jeffrey offered no explanation, but he indicated to Officer Rolf Muller that the handcuff was on the dresser in the bedroom. When the officer entered the bedroom, Jeffrey made an attempt to push past him to retrieve the key himself. 
the second officer, Robert Rath, ordered Jeffrey to, quote, back off. Officer Muller walked to the dresser and found the top drawer open. On closer inspection, he saw scores of Polaroid photographs inside, some of which depicted nude men in various stages of dismemberment. Officer Muller noted the decor of the room in the photographs. It was the room which he now stood. He walked back into the living room where his partner was talking to Jeffrey. He held the Polaroids up and when he saw the shocked look on his partner's face, he said, quote, these are for real. When Jeffrey realised that the officers had found his photographs, he suddenly lunged forward, fighting in an attempt to evade arrest. Pamela Bass, a neighbour, heard the police officers tussle with Jeffrey, with one officer shouting, quote, get the f***ing cuffs to his partner. During the commotion, Pamela heard Jeffrey fight against a restraint and would later describe what she heard, saying, quote, he howled like an animal, just a loud screeching, inhuman. After backup was radioed in, Officer Muller opened the refrigerator. Inside, he made eye contact with the severed head of a black male. The officer turned to Jeffrey, who looked straight back at him, and he said, quote, For what I did, I should be dead. A detailed search of the apartment was quickly ordered and conducted by the Criminal Investigation Bureau. Although pre-warned of what they were likely to find inside, many of the officers who entered apartment 213, donned in protective hazard suits and breathing apparatus, had to undergo specialist psychological counselling to help recover from what they had found. A total of four severed heads were found in and around the kitchen and inside the fridge. A soup pan on the stove was found to contain human brains that had been marinated in a tomato broth. A selection of hands and feet were also found boiled in another pan. In the kitchen, officers recovered several glass jars which contained the genitalia of three men which had been preserved in saline. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found inside the bedroom. In addition, Officers found a pool of blood at the bottom of the fridge, along with two human hearts and lumps of human muscle, each wrapped in plastic sandwich bags. Inside the freezer, officers discovered an entire torso, plus a bag full of human organs. Miscellaneous pieces of human flesh were stuck in ice at the bottom of the freezer. Elsewhere, officers found two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, and a mummified scalp. In a large blue drum in the bedroom, they recovered three torsos dissolving in acid, a total of 74 Polaroids, which detailed the dismemberment and dissection of several men, were found throughout the apartment. When talking about recovering body parts, Jeffrey Jensen, the chief medical examiner on the Dharma case, commented that, quote, it is like we were dismantling someone's museum. Jeffrey Jensen also reflected on the search of the apartment, saying, quote, There was a portable freezer in the front room, and it was almost out of place in its position. We really kind of walked around it for the longest time. I guess we didn't have the nerve to open it up and see what was inside, but we didn't anticipate anything. But once we opened up the container and saw another, another head in there, it became, you know, it became real for us, I think. Jeffrey Jensen would also describe how they kept finding more and more body parts, saying, quote, We're walking down the hallway, there was a small closet, and there was a large stainless steel cook pot, and when we looked in there, there were some human hands and male genitalia that had been dried or desiccated. Investigators commented that there was very little actual food in the apartment, just condiments. This led officers to believe that Jeffrey had mostly fed on the flesh of his victims. Beginning in the early hours of June 23, 1991, Jeffrey was questioned by Detective Patrick Kennedy. Over the following two weeks, Detective Kennedy and later Detective Patrick Murphy would conduct many interviews with Jeffrey, which when combined totaled over 60 hours. 
Jeffrey had waived his right for a lawyer throughout the entirety of the interrogation, claiming he wished to confess to everything, saying, quote, I created this horror, and it only makes sense. I do everything to put an end to it. Jeffrey admitted to murdering 17 men, 16 in Milwaukee and one in Ohio. During police interviews, Jeffrey admitted to necrophilia with many of his victims, including on one occasion performing sexual acts during dismemberment. Jeffrey also spoke of the huge effort in dismembering a body. He explained how blood would pour inside the chest cavity after death, and as a result, he would have to first remove all internal organs, then suspend the torso over the bathtub to drain. Jeffrey also admitted to cannibalism, having eaten hearts, livers, biceps and other muscles of his victims. He explained that by eating parts of the body, his victim would become a part of him, a way to keep them with him. It became clear to investigators that although 17 men died at his hands, Jeffrey did not particularly enjoy the killing. It was not the driving force behind his lust. The desire to have the ultimate submissive sexual partner became an obsession and the only way to fulfil his fantasies was to murder them. It was a means to an end, as Jeffrey put it. However, the act of dismemberment was a huge sexual thrill in which he received immense pleasure. When asked if he felt sexually excited whilst dismembering a victim, Jeffrey said, quote, As time went on, yes, it did get sexual. I started saving the skeletons and preserve other body parts, and one thing led to another, as it took more and more deviant type behaviours to satisfy my urges. Investigating officers wanted to know why the rate of killing dramatically increased in the last two months. Jeffrey claimed he was completely swept along with his compulsions to kill, adding, Quote, it was an incessant and never-ending desire to be with someone at whatever cost. It just filled my thoughts all day long. During interrogation, Jeffrey explained the reason he kept the skulls and in two cases kept the entire skeletons of his victims. He explained he was in the process of constructing a private altar which would stand as a constant reminder of his murders. He planned to place the skulls upon the black table in his living room the table which he had photographed several bodies, and displayed the skulls as a centrepiece. Adorned at the end of the table would stand the skeletons of Ernest Miller and Oliver Lacey. When officers asked Jeffrey whom the altar was for, he answered, quote, Myself, it was a place where I could feel at home. He also explained it would be used as a place for meditation, where he would draw the strength and power from those he killed. Investigators asked whether he was close to completing the altar, to which he replied, quote, If this, his arrest, had happened six months later, that's what you would have found. On July 25th, 1991, Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was charged on four counts of murder. By August 22nd, he was charged with a further 11. On September 14th, Investigators in Ohio had discovered hundreds of bone fragments in the location that Jeffrey claimed he murdered his first victim. After investigation, medical examiners formally identified two molars and a vertebrae, which were then x-rayed and determined that they had belonged to Stephen Hicks. Three days later, Jeffrey was charged with the murder of Stephen Hicks. Jeffrey was never charged with the attempted murder of Tracy Edwards, nor with the murder of Stephen Tomey. He was not charged with Tomey's murder because the Milwaukee County District Attorney could not bring charges of murder if it could not be proven beyond reasonable doubt. As Jeffrey had no memory of actually committing murder and the fact there was no physical evidence of the murder, it could not be proven. At a scheduled preliminary hearing on January 13th, 1992, Jeffrey pled guilty to all charges of murder in the first degree. However, his counsel claimed diminished responsibility due to insanity. The trial of Jeffrey Dahmer began on January 30th, 1992, in which he was tried for 16 counts of murder before Judge Lawrence Graham 
By pleading guilty earlier in the month, Jeffrey had waived his right to an initial trial to establish guilt. The issue to be debated during the trial was determine whether Jeffrey suffered from a mental condition that would mean he was not fit to stand trial. The prosecution's main argument that was that having a mental disorder did not deprive Jeffrey the ability to appreciate the criminality of his conduct, nor did it deprive him the ability to resist his impulses. The defence argued that the mental disease Jeffrey suffered, plus the intense obsessions of lust, meant he was unable to stop or alter his actions. Defence expert Dr. Fred Berlin, a specialist in sexual disorders, testified that Jeffrey was unable to conform to law at the time he committed the murders as he had suffered from paraphilia and more specifically necrophilia. Furthermore, Dr. Carl Walstam, a forensic psychiatrist, diagnosed Jeffrey with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, necrophilia, alcohol dependence and a psychotic disorder all of which left him unable to control his behaviour. The prosecution rejected the defence's argument, declaring Jeffrey was not insane. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Philip Resnick testified that Jeffrey did not suffer from necrophilia, as Jeffrey himself had stated he preferred live sexual partners. This was evident in the fact that he had attempted to create his own unresistant, submissive sexual partners by injecting acid into their brains. Jeffrey's desire was to dominate, not to purely have sex with the dead. District Attorney Michael McCann took the stand and insisted Jeffrey was not insane, but was in fact a calculated, rational murderer who suffered from deviant behaviour, but who was completely sane. Michael McCann called Dr. Frederick Allen Fostall to the stand to substantiate the claim he told the courtroom that, quote, a mental status examination showed Dharma to be in control, in my professional opinion. He does have a psychiatric disorder and had this disorder before, during and after his slayings. This disorder is sexual in nature, principally necrophilia, but this disorder does not in itself make him lack substantial capacity to conform his behaviour to the requirement of the law. As well as professional medical experts, the defence presented Jeffrey's last intended victim, Tracy Edwards, to the stand. He told the disgusted court what he was subjected to in apartment 213. He described seeing a huge blood stain on the mattress he was put on, and later, when re-entering the apartment with police officers, he saw a severed hand under the bed. He told the jury how Jeffrey had told him that, quote, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to kill you. I've done this before. Don't make a move. Fighting back tears, Edwards told how Jeffrey condemned him, saying, quote, You'll never leave here. It won't be long. I'll show you things you won't believe. Edwards testified that Jeffrey had retrieved a human skull from within a filing cabinet and told Edwards, quote, this is how I get people to stay with me. You will stay with me too. Edwards remarked how on first meeting Jeffrey, saying, quote, He seemed friendly and normal at first, but turned crazy. Like I told police the first time, this freak, this guy is trying to kill me. Milwaukee attorney, a member of Jeffrey's council, Gerald Boyle, asked Edwards, What impression was made on your mind? by the conduct of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the acts of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the manner, experience and the circumstances of Jeffrey Dahmer that you observed. Edward simply replied, it's like I told the police, this guy is crazy. Gerald Boyle would later use a large blackboard to illustrate Jeffrey's increasing madness, saying, quote, he begins by living for the weekends and ends up eating his victims and spending most of his time in bed. As a total human being, that is what I see in Jeffrey Dahmer, a person who is into cannibalism, a druggy obsessed with sexual fantasies and perversions, rocking and chanting. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. 
he started to experiment more and more because his sickness is growing greater and greater. He began taking photographs of his victims' corpses. He didn't even know that he was mentally ill. He just thought he was bad. I submit to you that Jeffrey Dahmer is so out of control that he cannot be punished by ordering imprisonment. He is out of control. Two court-appointed mental health professionals, forensic psychiatrist George Palermo and clinical psychologist Samuel Friedman, testified independently from either prosecution or defence. Palermo would state that the murders were the result of, quote, pent-up aggression within himself. He killed these men because he wanted to kill the source of his homosexual attraction to them. In killing them, he killed what he hated in himself. Palermo concluded that Jeffrey was a sexual sadist with antisocial behaviour disorder, but was legally sane. Friedman argued that Jeffrey killed because he longed for companionship, saying, quote, Mr. Dharma is not psychotic. He then spoke kindly of Jeffrey, describing him as, quote, amiable, pleasant to be with, courteous, with a sense of humour, conventionally handsome and charming in manner. He was, and still is, a bright young man. He also diagnosed Jeffrey with a personality disorder with borderline obsessive compulsion and sadistic traits. He also expressed his professional belief that Jeffrey was legally sane. The prosecution's final argument was to accuse Jeffrey of suffering from a disordered mind, not a diseased one, and as such should be deemed responsible for his actions. They pleaded with the jury to identify with the victims, not with the defendant. The officer who had made the initial arrest of Jeffrey took the stand. He told the court, quote, I began questioning him about the way in which he selected and approached his victims. He stated that before going out for the evening, he generally knew whether or not he planned to commit a homicide. The trial would last two weeks, and on February 14th, both counsels delivered their closing arguments to the jury. Each counsel were allowed to present for two hours each. Gerald Boyle took the time to repeatedly refer to the testimonies he had from mental health professionals, almost all of which diagnosed Jeffrey with a mental disease. Boyle argued that his compulsive killings were the result of, quote, sickness, a sickness that he discovered, not chose. He finished by declaring Jeffrey was a profoundly sick individual who was, quote, so out of control he could not conform his conduct anymore. Following Boyle's 75-minute closing argument, Michael McCann took the stand for the prosecution, where he described Jeffrey as sane and in full control, knowing exactly what he was doing. This was evident by the extreme means he used to stay undetected. He declared that Jeffrey killed with hostility, anger, frustration, resentment and hatred, and that all 17 victims had, quote, died merely to afford Dharma a period of sexual pleasure. McCann closed by stating that by Jeffrey pleading guilty but insane to the charges, he was only trying to escape the responsibility and punishments of the crimes. On February 15th, the court reconvened to hear the verdict. Jeffrey Dharma was ruled to be legally sane and had not suffered from a mental disorder at the time of the murders for which he was tried. On the first two counts, Jeffrey was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, plus 10 years. The remaining 14 counts all carried a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment without parole, plus 70 years. The death penalty, which many people called for, was never an option for Judge Graham to consider at the penalty phase, as the state of Wisconsin had abolished capital punishment. In an unprecedented move, Judge Graham allowed relatives of the victims to deliver impact statements to the court. Dorothy Strauter, mother of Curtis Strauter, spoke directly to Jeffrey, looking him in the eyes, and said, quote, My name is Dorothy Strauter. I'm Curtis Strauter's mother. Um, I don't have nothing prepared to say. It's just a few things that I would like to say. 
you took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I loved him the last time I saw him, which will be a year tomorrow. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. She'll never have a chance to sing and dance with him again. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her, and for that I can never forgive you. I hope you, I hope you can deal with what you've done. I'm trying hard to. You almost destroyed me, but I refuse to let you destroy me. I will carry on. Rita Isbell, older sister to Errol Lindsay, gave an emotional but volatile statement, saying... My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, mother... Rita had to be restrained as she charged at Geoffrey. Once proceedings were done, Geoffrey himself was given time to deliver a personal statement. He said, quote, Your Honour, you know it's all over now. It has never been a case of trying to get free. I never wanted freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This has been a case to tell the world that I did what I did, not for reasons of hate. I hate no one. I knew I was sick, or evil, or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors told me about my sickness, and now I have some peace. I realise how much harm I have caused. I did my best to make amends after my arrest, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. My attempts to help identify the remains was the best I could do, and that was hardly anything. I feel so bad for what I did, to those poor families and I understand their rightful hate. They also know I will be in prison for the rest of my life and I know I will have to turn to God to get me through each day. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. Thank God there will be no more harm that I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. I decided to go through with this trial for a number of reasons. One of these was to let the world know that these were not crimes of hate. I wanted the people of Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I did not want the world to think these were hate crimes. I did not want any unanswered questions. Now, all the questions have been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle and myself decided that maybe there was a way to tell the world that they could get some help before they end up being hurt or hurting someone. I think the trial did that, and I take the blame for what I did. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me for what I have done. Thank you, Your Honour. Now I am prepared for your sentence, for which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. Upon sentencing, Jeffrey was transferred to Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. For the first year of his incarceration, Jeffrey was placed in solitary confinement due to concerns for his physical safety should he come into contact with fellow inmates. After a year of solitary confinement, Jeffrey consented to be transferred to a less secure unit where he was assigned a two-hour work detail program, cleaning the toilet block. During his sentence, Jeffrey devoted himself to Christianity and become a born-again Christian. In May 1994, Jeffrey was baptised by Ray Ratcliffe, a minister in the Church of Christ. Following his baptism, Ratcliffe would visit Jeffrey on a weekly basis where they would regularly discuss the prospect of death, with Jeffrey questioning whether he was sinning against God by continuing to live. In July 1994, a fellow inmate, Osvaldo Dorothy, attempted to slash Jeffrey's throat with a razor blade as Jeffrey returned from a weekly church service. 
Jeffrey received superficial wounds, but was not seriously hurt in the attack. Jeffrey retained regular contact with his father and stepmother, and he also began to have visits from his mother, who, prior to his arrest, had not seen Jeffrey since Christmas 1983. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Jeffrey was cleaning the toilet block as assigned by his work detail. Accompanying him were two other inmates, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver, a schizophrenic who referred to himself as Christ. During the work detail, the trio were left unsupervised for around 20 minutes as they cleaned the showers in the prison gymnasium. At around 8.10am, a prison officer discovered Jeffrey laying on the shower floor, bleeding from head and facial wounds, having been bludgeoned with a 20-inch metal bar. His head had also been repeatedly struck against the shower's tiled floor during the assault. Although Jeffrey was alive when found by the officer, he was pronounced dead just an hour later. Jesse Anderson had also been beaten with the same weapon, and he too died two days later. Christopher Scarver, who was serving a life sentence for a murder committed in 1990, admitted that he was the one who had attacked the two inmates, saying, quote, God told me to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Scarver reported that during the attack, Jeffrey had said, quote, I do not care if I live or die. Go ahead and kill me. Other than that, Jeffrey remained completely silent for the remainder of the attack. Upon learning of Jeffrey's death, Joyce Dahmer spoke angrily to the media, saying, quote, Now is everybody happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? Lionel Dahmer believed that there was a conspiracy surrounding Jeffrey's death. During an interview with Larry King in 2004, Lionel said, quote, I talked with an attorney who has access to that prison quite intimately and what happened was there were there was about 20 to 40 minutes of time when no one that is the staff of the prison no one knew the whereabouts of this person who took a barbell the rod the bar from the weightlifting equipment and hid it and bludgeoned Jeff to death Larry King in response asked quote, in other words he they let him loose for all that time without knowing the whereabouts to a prisoner. Answering, Lionel said, quote, I, this attorney said he was confident that it was something that was allowed to happen, as he put it. Over the course of the years, Jeffrey Lionel Dharma killed 17 young men and boys. They were Stephen Hicks, 19 Stephen Tuomi, 26 James Dox Tater, 14. Richard Guerrero, 25. Anthony Sears, 26. Eddie Smith, 36. Raymond Smith, 27. Ernest Miller, 22. David Thomas, 23. Curtis Strauter, 19. Errol Lindsay, 19. Tony Hughes, 31. Conorak Simpson Phone, 14. Matt Turner, 20. Jeremiah Weinberger, 23. Oliver Lacey, 23. And Joseph Braidhoft, 25.